Hello everybody, this is John Fenn, now with number four out of a four-part series talking about how the Lord heals our emotions, and in this segment, talking about rebuilding, reestablishing healthy emotions, healthy thoughts. Because, you know, the truth is that we interact with our world through our emotions and our thoughts. And if our emotions are damaged, if we are bruised emotionally, then our thoughts then look at the world through those bruises, through those injuries, through that emotional hurt that we have. And so that we will completely misunderstand people and we will read into people's thoughts and gestures and we will completely misconstrue and misunderstand our world around us. And you probably have known that where you've had somebody who's having a trouble with strife perhaps, or they're very bitter and you will say something to them and they will totally misunderstand. They think that you're trying to su suggest something, you're trying, that you're trying to say something, when in fact all you're doing is just making a statement. And you think, how could they have misunderstood? And the reason is because their own hurts, their own emotional damage, and they are thinking thoughts in line with those emotions, and so they misunderstand the world around them. And this may be somebody that I'm talking to right now, that, that you've, for that reason, you've never felt a part of society. You've never felt like you fit in anywhere you were. In school, you didn't fit in. At work, you didn't fit in. And you felt that, and you can tell, you can bear witness with what I'm saying is, because of the damage you had suffered emotionally and, and the thoughts that you carried, then you see and you think to your world through those damaged thoughts and those damaged emotions, and so you misunderstand people and everything. And it can make you paranoid, thinking people are against you or people are whispering about you and you never feel like you fit in. So we've got to talk about and what we're talking about is how do you actually counter that? How do you replace those thoughts with good thoughts? And this brings out a spiritual principle that we see first with John the Baptist where he was talking to people about repenting and he said, repent and show me proof of your repentance. You know, um, it's not, we have a church culture that would say just stop sinning, just stop doing what you're doing. And that is not exactly right. That's not the Bible actually. John the Baptist said when you repent, replace that sin with a fruit of righteousness, an act of righteousness. John the Baptist was not just calling people to repent, he was saying replace that sin with something good. It's kind of like sometimes you'll hear people and they'll say when I quit smoking cigarettes, I gain 10 kilos in my body. And be, the reason is they could not just stop smoking. They had to replace the smoking and they replaced it with food. So they gained 10 kilos when they stopped the smoking. See, our whole world, even our, our whole body is, is designed not to just stop something, but to replace it with something else. I once knew a man who was used to getting drunk on, uh, on the weekends right after work because a lot of his buddies from work would uh, go and, and buy a big keg of beer, a big bunch of beer and everything, and then they'd have a party. And then the man got born again, he got saved. And he, for a time, he tried to just stop going to that Friday night party. But you know, finally, after he was really struggling with it, and I, I had to tell him, I said, well, replace that, that beer party with something else. And so as a result, he found very quickly the Lord's grace. Uh, his church had a prayer meeting on Friday night and kind of an outreach as well. And so instead of going to get drunk on Friday night with his buddies from work, he didn't just stop that, he replaced it with that prayer meeting and that outreach group at his church on Friday nights. And so this is the healthy way, this is the biblical way of doing it. Don't listen to this series and think you can just stop thinking those bruised thoughts, those injured thoughts, that, and, and stop having those injured emotions. The only way, the only way to receive healing is to replace that death that is in you, that bruise that is in you, that, that, that injury that is within you. You have to replace it with truth. That goes back to our foundational scripture in Isaiah 42, verses three and four, where the Lord said, he will not fail nor be discouraged until he brings truth into light, bring judgment or justice into light, into your life, into your earth, into your world. And so what that's saying is he is going to continually try to get you to understand that it's not just a matter of stopping thinking one thing or suddenly have a good self image of yourself and suddenly love yourself, but rather that he's going to help you replace that old stuff with new stuff, old thoughts with new thoughts, new old ways with new ways. 
And that's why I shared in the previous segment, segment about Isaiah 55, where the Lord said, forsake your old ways and thoughts and come up to my ways and my thoughts because they're higher. You want to live in that higher existence. You were created for that. And so this is the way it's done. We already saw examples, the woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery, the, the man with the withered arm, the man who's had demons cast out. Each time the Lord acknowledged where they were, told them they were free, and then set them on a course where it would make them make new decisions. It would be a, a situation where they had to make new decisions, where they had to make new thoughts and a new life for themselves. And uh, you know, I'm being real honest here. Do you, do you have what it takes? I mean, do you wanna just sit there in your pain and your misery or do you really want set free? You see, because a lot of people say, oh, I wanna, I wanna be set free of this. But, um, but I want the Lord to do it for me so I don't have to do any work. You know, people tend to want things given to them. But if you're a Christian and Christ is in you, Christ is in you. Uh, Paul made the statement to the Galatians in Galatians 4.19. He said, my little children, I'm travailing in birth again until Christ be formed in you. I'm travailing in birth. He was using birth pangs where there's intense pains and then a time of rest, intense pain, then a time of rest. He says, I'm praying for you intensely in a, a series of birth pains until Christ is formed in you. In other words, Paul is saying that Christ is in you and you, he wants to grow up in you in all things. He wants to affect your mind. He wants to affect your emotions. He wants to affect your memory. But do you have what it takes? Again, I'm not here just to say, I'm not here to tell you a lie. You know, I'm not here to tell you that Jesus is just going to touch you on the head and zap. He's going to take away all your memories and all the past and everything else. I'm not going to do that. The pattern we've seen in scripture over and over is people who want to change. Do you want to change? That's the question. Do you have what it takes that you want to change? You want to start thinking higher ways and higher thoughts and come out of your past, come out of that past life and that past emotion, the past way of thinking. If you have what it takes, then the Lord will join with you and he will give you opportunity every step of the way in a process, a gentle process usually, a process over time. Like I said, in my case, it took 10 years for me to work through the things with my dad. So you're talking about an ongoing process where the Lord will work with, work with you when he will bring up memories and things that can stir you up, but then you have the opportunity to say, okay, I'm gonna think new thoughts. I'm going to forgive in this situation instead of be angry. And the old ways are thinking angry and bitter and everything else. I'm gonna think new ways. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, forgive. I'm going to pray for that person who hurt me. And those are the higher ways and the higher thoughts. It's a matter of, there's this principle involved in John 8:44 where Jesus speaking of the devil in John 8, 44 says, when he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. Some translations will say it this way. When, when Satan speaks a lie, he speaks according to his nature or he speaks what comes naturally to him. And that understanding is accurate as far as it goes. But in the Greek language, it was, it, it's much more than that. It is the fact that when Satan speaks a lie, he's standing by himself. It is according to his nature, but it is one which he does by himself. And see, there's this power of agreement where Jesus said, if two or three are gathered in my name, I'm in the midst. Um, it's this, it's this the fact that we've got the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, we've got angels, we've got all of heaven to agree with us as we launch into a new life, as we start thinking new thoughts. And when the devil's out there, he's on the outside. He's no longer part of your life. He's not, no longer in you, of you, anything else. He's on the outside. When he speaks a lie, he speaks by himself. He's on the outside looking in and he's looking for somebody to agree with him. Now, if you've grown up with the emotional damage, hurts, bruises emotionally, and you've believed lies about God, lies about other people, you've seen the world through, through uh, the, the eyes of bruises and hurts emotionally so that you have misunderstood people and never fit in and misunderstood the way things are, then there comes a time, then what you've done is you've basically agreed with Satan because Satan is the one whispering to you, look, they're against you. Oh, look, they hate you. Oh, you don't fit in. Oh, you're no good. You'll never amount to anything. Oh, you're not very pretty. You're not very handsome. You're not very smart. You can never have that dream. And, and that's the enemy in there. And he's looking for somebody to agree with him. And that's been your past. You've agreed with him. You're right. My mom said I'll never amount to anything. I'm not very smart. I, I guess I'm not going to amount to anything. I'm never going to be any, I'm not smart. I won't be anything. You found that, he, Satan has found someone to agree with him. And when you agree with the devil, it, it's like it's opening a door into your life. It's opening a pathway into your life. And so what we're saying here, what Jesus was able to do with each of these people that we've given this example to, uh, examples here, is that he was able to get them to stop their agreement with the past and start agreeing with God 
and let him set their future. And so that's what I'm saying to you. There, there's a point that you have to stop agreeing with the devil. You can't look at your past and say, okay, well, that's the way it was. You have to look at it in new light, like the woman at the well who in John 4, 39 said, Jesus told me everything I ever did. That resets her understanding that she was not alone. She was not just pushing through of her own strength, that the Lord was actually there watching and waiting for a time when he could reach her, waiting for a time till her heart was prepared where he could bring wholeness to her. But up until that point, there's agreement with the devil. Now, when you, when you say, okay, God, I'm, I'm believing your thoughts and your ways, you break that agreement and, the, and Satan moves out to the outside. But you've had these thoughts in your mind for years and years. So how do you walk it out? What, I mean, what do you do? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, says that we throw down imaginations and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We throw down imaginations. Again, this is the work of the gospel. This is the work of renewing the mind. This is the work of becoming a Christian who is whole emotionally. This is, this is where the Holy Spirit joins with us to think new thoughts, to make it an easier work, and yet at the same time, we must initiate it. We must do it. We must say, I've got what it takes. I'm tired of living in oppression and, and hopelessness and bondage, and, and I want a new life. And, how, and, and you cast down imaginations. What's that mean? An imagination in this case is having to do with your memory and your ideas of the way you see yourself. Whether you hate yourself, whether you are struggling with, with maybe something happened to you, and even as a child you thought, you thought maybe it's my fault, maybe I'm the one to blame. And, and you believe those lies and so when that lie comes up to you, let's say, let's say a child is abused or neglected or maybe their parents divorce when they're little and the child blames themselves, say it was my fault. I mean, this is what happened to me. I'm just taking a little bit from my own life here. When my mom and dad divorced, we four children, I'm the oldest of four, we four children got around and we just said, well, if we weren't alive, maybe mom and dad would still be together. If we weren't here, should we run away? I mean, we had thoughts like that as children, but we blamed ourselves for our parents' divorce. We were too young to understand that there were, there were adult issues between my parents uh, that were just beyond our knowing. But as children, you tend to take the blame to yourself. It's, it, you know, and so Satan is right there to tell us, it's your fault that your parents are divorced. It's your fault that you were sexually molested. It's your fault that you were neglected or abused. You did something wrong. If it's all about you. And you carry that all through. And now Jesus is standing there saying, I'm, I was right there with you in the past. I didn't abandon you. I have brought you to this point for healing. You have to be willing right now to let loose of those lies and say, oh, I see in, in new life, I see this now that you were there and you've brought me to this point where I can receive healing. And now I'm gonna pray for that abuser. I'm gonna pray for my parents who, who neglected me. I'm gonna pray for whatever the case may be, that you reach out in love to that and you change the way you think. You pull down the imagination. Like that man who had been, um, the man who'd been uh, cast, had legion cast out of him. And Jesus said, go back to your friends. So when he went back to his friends, he had all those old thoughts come up, but he immediately met those thoughts with the new thoughts. Because Jesus said, tell them the power of God and the compassion of God. That's what the, the Lord had told him in Mark chapter five. And uh, the verse there, now I flipped over there and I don't recall what it was, but it was Mark chapter five. And he said, tell them the power of God and the compassion of God. Thank you, it's verse 19, Mark 5, uh, uh, 5 19. And so that's what you've got to do. You and I have to do this. It's, it's, we've got to go back and we have to tell those thoughts. We have to tell those imaginations about the power of God and the compassion of God in our lives. And we say, I'm not thinking like that anymore. I'm going to love myself. You know, there's a, there's a scripture in Mark chapter four. And in Mark chapter four, it's the parable of the sower. And one of the things that Jesus says in verse uh, 17 are that there are a set of people, there are groups of people who receive the gospel they receive the Lord, but they have no root in themselves. In other words, he likens it to a seed that's on rocky ground. And so that seed will start to put down roots, but there's no real soil for that seed to take root of, you know, because it's rocky ground. And the Lord says this, he says, because of affliction or persecution, they stumble. Affliction and persecution. Affliction just means the pressure of circumstances, and persecution means the opinions of others. And so Jesus says there are people out there who, who receive the gospel, but they have rocks in their heart. In other words, they've got these bruises emotionally. They've got these issues going on. 
And, and here's the sign of it. They stumble at people's opinions and the pressures of life. These are Christians who are loving the Lord, but for whatever reason, if somebody's opinion is against them, they crumble. It, it destroys them. It hurts them. If somebody thinks wrong of them or expresses an opinion, they just cannot stand in the, before that person if they have a different opinion. And the other thing he said besides persecution, which is a person's opinion, but he said affliction, and affliction is the circumstances. And he says that they cannot stand up to other people's opinions nor the circumstances because they have no root in themselves. And we have to look, say, okay, the Bible answers the Bible. What about that root in yourself? Where does that come from? Well, that answer is found in Ephesians chapter 3 and in verse 17. And in Ephesians 3, 17, Paul is praying, and he said that you may be rooted and grounded in love. You see, this is agape love. This is unconditional love, the, the verb that Paul uses there, agape or agapeo. And it means unconditional love, that you may be rooted and grounded in love. And with that love, you'll be able to comprehend and to know the love of God that is beyond head knowledge, mental knowledge, but you'll know it in your heart. So this tells us that back in Mark chapter 4, verse 17, when Jesus said, there are people out there who have no root in themselves, and so they crumble in the face of other people's opinions or in the face of circumstances, the pressure of circumstances. They just tend to crumble. They can't stand. They love the Lord, but they don't know why they just crumble, you know, when, when people uh, have a different opinion or, or whether the circumstances are very tight for them or very pressured. And Ephesians 3.17 says that, that we are to be rooted in unconditional love. So it tells me that these people back there in Mark 4.17 who crumble in the face of adversity, who crumble in the face of another person's opinion, need to know unconditional love. Because see, in this series, I've talked about principles. I, I've pointed out to you the way that the Lord leads people into wholeness. And, and I've talked about how each person had to go and they had to think new thoughts. They had to see their past in, in light of the truth of God's word and God's destiny for their lives. You know, the, the man who had legion cast out had to go back to his home and his friends, and he had to think new thoughts. He had to tell them the power of God and the, and the compassion of God in, the, in his life. And, and so when you're going through, I'm, I, I'm saying that this can be just all principle to you. This can be all talk to you unless you actually know unconditional love. And the way to know the unconditional love is to know your heavenly father. You see, Jesus said in John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Now, that verse tells us that Jesus is the way, but the Father is our destination. No one comes to the Father but by me is what Jesus said. So Jesus is the way, but the Father is our destination. And maybe you're listening to me and you say, I really don't know my heavenly Father. Here's what I encourage you to do. He's the source of unconditional love. He is the one you need to know. And a lot of times people with emotional hurt and bruises and the, the damage that we've been talking about, they love Jesus, even though they have questions in their life about why they've gone through what they've gone through, but they cannot relate to the Heavenly Father. They, they can read God so loved the world that he gave his son, and they accept that mentally, but they don't really know because they think that Jesus is good, but the Father, you know, after all, I did go through all these things. And they can read John chapter 14 and verse 9 where Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And they can read that mentally, but they, they don't know the Father on a personal level on a daily basis. And all that I'm talking about with replacing old thoughts with new thoughts, undergoing a metamorphosis, acting like a... Um, the, go, the caterpillar that's in the cocoon that's, that's gradually becoming a butterfly, that process that takes place. It's all internal. It's all unseen. And there can be all these wonderful things where God is teaching you how to think new thoughts going on. But the point is, you need to know the Father God. He is the source of everything. He's the one, after I was first born again, that I've talked to almost exclusively. It is the love of the Father that we have to know. And, and the way to do that is to talk to him. Not with form, not with formula, not with structure, but talk to him. I had, I've had people write me before. I had one recently who said, you know, I've bound the devil. I've made my daily confession. I have proclaimed and declared things. I have prayed for repentance for the curse of the generations, the, all my sins of all my ancestors, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, and still I feel so distant. I don't feel like I can feel God. 
And, and that's what we're talking about right now is, is how are, do you become aware of the Father God's presence and his love for you? And I, here's what I would advise you. Talk to him. Find ways to be thankful. When Develop a thankful heart. Because in all of these things, this is, this is supposing that you want to think right thoughts. This is supposing that you want to put the energy into it that will battle the evil imaginations of your past and you will have the energy and you will have the discipline to develop to stop entertaining those old thoughts and replace them with new thoughts that God loves me, God has a plan for me, and that you will, you will rise to the occasion and say, this is what Jesus wants me to do, that you can be as good as the woman at the well who was now faced with the decision of what she's going to do with that man she's living with, or the woman caught in adultery who had to go and sin no more and cut off that relationship. That takes energy. That takes strength. That takes a determination you know, emotional determination. The man with the withered arm who suddenly could go back to work and had to find a job. And think about all the blind men that Jesus healed and the deaf people and the crippled people. They all had to get up. They had to get on their feet. They had to find a job, get a home. They had tough decisions to make that came about as a result of their healing. It's no different with emotional healing. And that's what I've shown you here today, is that, is that emotional healing will require you to walk some things out. It will require some work. It will require when, when a thought comes up about how terrible you are and how ugly you are and how God doesn't love you, you have to have the mental discipline to capture, capture that thought, cast it down and say, no, God loves me. God loves me. I know that he loves me. Jesus died for me, and God the Father loves me. He so loved the world that he sent Jesus. He so loved me that he gave me all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. He so loved me that Ephesians 2, 7 says, in the ages to come, it is the Father who will continue to show forth his kindness towards us. You know, and you counter those thoughts with scripture thoughts. So I encourage you to, number one, include the Father in your daily life. Lay aside your formulas for a time. Lay aside your your Bible reading plan of, you know, your memory verse and all the different things that act as action, performance that you were trying to do to impress God or to please God. And I'm just telling you to know God. Stop trying to do things to, to impress him and to, to be the Christian you're supposed to be and draw back and just say, Father, I want to get to know you. You can thank him for the sunshine. You can thank him for the weather. You can thank him for that parking space that you find when you're driving around, around town. You can thank him for the little coincidences that happen. Oh, thank you for that sale at the store. You find ways, you develop a thankful heart and you look for ways to be thankful. That's one of the biggest things you can do is when you get your eyes off of yourself because the old ways are like a person looking in the rearview mirror in the vehicle or looking over their shoulder. The old ways are like continually looking behind you, trying to drive forward, but continually trying to look over your shoulder or look in the rearview mirror. And, and what you have to do is when you develop a thankful heart for what you do have, thank you for what he has done in your life, and, and you're not looking at if the cup is half full or half empty, and you change from saying it's half empty and you start saying it's half full. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you that at least I'm going to heaven. Thank you that I, that I believe your word. Thank you that I've got these good friends. Thank you that I've got a roof over my head. And you start developing thankfulness and you start looking for th ways to be thankful. And you start thanking the Father, don't just say Jesus, but the Father. The Father is the creator. He is the source of all things. Uh, he used his son to create the world, but the Father is the planner. The Father is the source of all things. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I think it's about verse 28, says that, that when uh, all the world is submitted to the Son, then the Son is going to give it all back, give the kingdom all back to the Father so that God the Father can be glorified. You know, the Father is the source. He so loved the world that he gave his Son. So develop that thankful heart by looking for things to be thankful for. And again, if you, if you start doing things that are performance oriented, like you have a prayer request and so you think, uh oh, I better show God I am very serious about my prayer request. I better go to church one extra time this week. Or I'm gonna show God that I'm really serious. I really have this need in my life. So I'm gonna get up an extra five minutes and pray hard just to show him how sincere I am. That's performance. You're not going to, to impress God by those things. He wants you. Christ is in you. You know, Romans 1, or excuse me, Colossians 1.26 says, Christ is in you, the hope of glory. So this is where you commune with him. And this is where you talk to the Father. And you say, Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that you've brought me to this place. Thank you for the sun. It's starting to come around now. Thank you for the season. You find good things to say in each season of life. You find good things. It's a matter of a thankful heart. 
See, we've gone full circle here. We've gone around starting in Isaiah chapter 42, and that's where we'll end, where it says, Behold my servant who I uphold. This is verses 1 through 4. And he says, I've put my spirit upon him. He's going to bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry. He'll not lift up his voice. He will not be yelled at or or heard in the street, screaming and yelling, in other words. Um, It says this, a bruised reed he will not break. A barely smoking candle or, or lamp he will not extinguish. He will bring forth justice into truth. He will not fail. He will not be discouraged until he has set justice in the earth. And so what that's talking about is he's not going to do further damage. This is new territory for you. For, for the man who had legion cast out, it was new territory for him to go back to his home and, and talk to his friends about the great power of God and compassion in his life. It was new territory for the woman who had been caught in adultery to break off that relationship and start to rebuild her life. It's new territory for the woman at the well who had such a reputation, she brought her whole village to the Lord, suddenly be faced now with the man that she's living with. Does she marry him or does she break it off? It's a new territory for the man with the withered arm, no matter how long that withered arm had been, that, that uh, he'd go out and get a job. So I pray for you for your strength right now. Father God, let it be that everyone listening to me have that strength, have that revelation, have the the fortitude on the inside, and let them invite you, Father, into their lives. And that's what you need to do right now. Just say, Father, take control of my life. Lord Jesus, take control of my life. I want to get to know you. Now, folks, when you do that, just start talking to them in your thoughts, in your heart, and find ways to be thankful. You'll find the Lord is tremendously involved, and he will chart that course for your new life, and you will be amazed at how amazing you feel and how lightness and airiness airiness you feel in your heart, in your emotions, and your thoughts. God bless you. Amen. Hi, everybody. This is John Fenn here once again at TV7, and I encourage you to partner with us, to be a part of the ministry, part of the fellowship of bringing this tremendous programming to Christians and the unsaved alike. You know, Paul had a time in his ministry where he was talking about, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, they were so eager to join with him in the ministry because they recognized they were partners in what he was doing. And an angel told the Roman centurion Cornelius in Acts 10.3 that his, his offerings had come up as a memorial before God. I'm telling you, when your, your gifts and your donations leave your hands, it doesn't stay here on the earth. In some way, God recognizes that and calls that to be a memorial before him. What an exciting thing to do, to be able to live our lives and to affect untold thousands of people by your giving. So I ask that you would join with us right now. The information is on your screen. It is so worthy, and I'm telling you, it's got an eternal weight, an eternal benefit to join with us in the ministry and the fellowship to the saints. God bless you for doing that. Thank you.